Okay, it's back over to you, darling. Okay, thank you, Tom. Again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this webinar presented by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Land Resources Management Program Wetlands Bureau on our new DOC registration process. Again, my name is Darlene Forst. I'm currently the Shoreland Section Supervisor here at the Wetlands Bureau, which means I handle those things within the protected shorelands as well as I have some responsibilities with the permitting of docks under the Wetlands Bureau. Helping me this evening will be Maria Jox, who is a business analyst here with the Wetlands Bureau. She will be moderating the questions and making sure that everyone's question is answered. So our agenda for this evening is an introduction to the dock registration program, its overview and benefits, as well as the online registration process, which will include a live demonstration of the software that we will bring online on June 15th. June 15th is the date on which this program becomes officially adopted and available for anyone who wishes to register their dock. After that, we'll have a brief Q&A session, or at least as long as we need to address everybody's concerns, after which we will conclude. During the live demonstrations, Please answer, go ahead and ask questions. Feel free to raise your hand to ask a question because some things may be easier to address while we are in those demo screens going through the submittal process than it might be to go back through and find them later on. So the DOC registration program, you know, what is it? The DOC registration program is a voluntary opt-in process. It is not mandatory. We are not going to require that everyone now register their DOC in addition to seeking permits. It is a voluntary opt-in process for the owners of non-title docking structures. And we highlight owners here because there will be an opportunity for agents to complete much of the process on behalf of dock owners and then transfer control of that file to the owner of the structure so that the owner may verify their information and submit their registration request to the department. The department will be able to tell who submitted the request and will only accept those submitted by the owners of the structures. We will be able to verify this through the email address of the person who submits it. Uh, the law does require only the owner can file. Also, moving on, what is this? This is an alternative to obtaining the dock repair permits currently required from the Wetlands Bureau for those repairs that will occur, occur in the wet under RSA 42A. This permitting requirement has existed since 1969. Again, any dock repair that occurs in the wet, uh, meaning under the water line at the time that the repair is conducted, does require a permit from the Wetlands Bureau. This is nothing new. It's also a way to provide evidence that structures, including seasonal structures, which might not need those repair permits, are in compliance with the law. We'll be more on that later. It's valid for five years and it is renewable. It is a highly streamlined process that can be completed online or by mail. It is not for residential use structures. So if there is a residence over public waters, or a structure, a docking structure that is physically attached to a residence over public waters, you cannot use this process for the repair or maintenance of that structure. And it's not for disputed structures, which means if you have a property which has an active complaint against that structure, either it is an active DES enforcement action or an active civil dispute specifically pertaining to that structure, under the, the language of the law, you cannot register that dock until those issues are settled. So why would you want to use this? Again, it is a highly streamlined process that can be completed in minutes by the owner of the docking structures. You do not need copies of the registration to be submitted to the town. You do not need any town clerk signatures, nor will you need conservation commission signatures. There are no tax map requirements, no USGS maps or butter addresses, or Natural Heritage Bureau reports required for this process. It will be reviewed within 10 days of the department receiving the registration fee. 
it is a $200 fee as opposed to the normal wetlands permitting fee of $400. And registered structures will be able to more immediately schedule and complete repairs if damage is incurred at any time of year, whenever, whatever may happen, so long as their re registration is valid. Why else might you use it? Everything we've said thus far pretty much pertains to people who own permanent structures. Well, there is a, a facet of this program which will facilitate property sales because it will provide much easier access to homeowners, potential home buyers, and other individuals regarding whether docks are considered to be in compliance with the law. It will basically be tied to the site and it will be tied to, it will be the registered plan and registrations will stay with the property. So if you have a registration number for a property, that will main, be maintained as a registration number for the property. So it will no longer be a matter with registered structures of looking through a long uh, file history or checking with the registry of deeds because if your structure is listed in the registration uh, database, it's considered to be prima facie legal under 482A, RSA 482A. This will provide peace of mind for seasonal dock owners who may have purchased a property that had a dock on it or inherit a property that had a dock on it who have no real way of proving whether or not a permit was issued for that dock. Maybe they don't know the owner uh, chain of the title who may have gotten that permit under what name, or it may have been per it may have been constructed before there was a permitting requirement, but they have no way of providing the evidence that that is in fact what occurred. So it's not unusual in the past for the department to get requests, please could you certify that my structure is grandfathered? Unfortunately, that is not something the department has been able to do because your structure either meets the quote unquote grandfather date, which for permanent structures was July 1 of 1969, or the seasonal grandfather status date of September 4th, 1978. The problem is whether or not that docking structure does pre-exist those dates. If you don't have the evidence to prove it, this could provide complications and delays, or if a complaint is received, just create unnecessary uh, difficulties and anxiety. The eligibility date, on the other hand, to, to qualify for this new registration process, will be January 1 of 2000, which puts us well into what is available technology on the internet um, and the advent of digital cameras to be able to prove that something qualifies for registration. And this is important because the language of the law clearly states that docking structures that are registered and maintained in accordance with this section shall be considered to be in compliance with this chapter, this chapter being RSA 482A. So what work would not be exempt? What, what can this not help you with? You cannot use this process to construct new structures. Now that does not mean you can't take out an existing seasonal dock and put in a brand new seasonal dock that's registered in the same size, location and configuration or completely remove a registered permanent dock and replace it with a completely new permanent dock in the same size, location, and configuration. It means you can't expand or add new pieces to that docking facility that weren't there before unless you do it through the normal wetlands permit process. And I think it's very important to note that if you have a registered structure, but you do get a permit to add to it, that does not invalidate your registration. Your registration is still valid. Those things that are registered are covered under the registration, which is valid for five years. Those things covered under the new permit are covered under the new permit, which is valid for a period of five years. Both of those terms are set by law. At the time you renew your registration, you simply add the newly permitted sections of the facility to the registered plans, the plans on record, and they will be folded right into the existing dock registration for the site. Other things that are not exempt, dredging, which includes rock removal or breaking rocks, which are deemed to be a navigational hazard. That's not considered maintenance of a docking structure. That's dredging. It requires a dredge and fill permit from wetlands. The Army Corps also would want to piggyback on that permit. Does not allow the addition 
of rock to a breakwater. The addition of rock to a breakwater is not repair, it's added fill. That would require a wetland permit. You can reset the existing rocks if existing rocks are dislodged or just generally shifted in a way that makes them unsafe. You cannot use this to repair non-docking structures like retaining wall beaches or culvert outfalls. You cannot use again this process to register residential structures and then repair those residential structures located over public waters. And it's not available for tidal docking structures. So having gotten those things out of the way, uh, Maria, do we have any questions just briefly about that section before we pop into the live uh, submittal process? We currently don't have any raised hand, but let's give people about 20 seconds to raise their hands if they want to ask a question. We have no question at this moment, so let's keep going with the demonstration. Okay, so. In order to access this new form and this new system, what you will want to do is go to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services website, come over here to the Resource Center, and look at DES forms. Uh, you'll notice up here, again, for most of you who are aware of this, it's www.des.nh.gov, Resource Center, NHDES Forms. This will bring you to this, the form finder. From here, you'll notice the form finder button is over here on the left. Up here on the right, on the near the introduction bar or the identification bar, there is a sign in button and a register button. As I go into the form finder, from here, I can type in, oops, doc, enter. It will pull up every form currently available related to docking structures in the NHDES form database. On January 15th, January 15th, excuse me, on June 15th, if you go into this particular page and you type in doc, one additional form will show up from what you see here. And that additional form will be the doc registration request form. When you click on that form to open that page, if you do not have a profile within NH, uh, the state's form database within our form finder and forms uh, section here, all you will see is a button to download the paper copy of the form so that you can mail it in. It is very important for anyone who wishes to use this electronic form filing system, whether it's the agent who will be providing a product to a homeowner to submit or the homeowner themselves wanting to do so. If you want to see forms and see online from submittals, you need to come in here to this register tab and set up your own user profile, as will the owner. As an agent, you will be able to share the things you create with the owners at the time of your choosing. They will not be able to submit it until you share it. Once you have registered and created a profile, Everything that you, every form that you start using your profile will be available to you in a history tab that I will show you in a moment. And you will sign in once you have your registration. So if you pull up register, let's see, again, it will say create user profile. Once you've created this user profile and you have your own um, individual login, personal login information, from that point on, you'll simply be able to sign into this system all of the things you've created in the past and their statuses for online submissions will be available to you through this website. So I'm going to switch out of the live version and I'm going to go to the version that we're using for the purposes of our demonstration tonight. So this is, you're in that same page on Enforms. 
and you want to sign in. So you have a profile. with your own personal password. You're going to see the first time you log in this screen right here that talks about the things that you can do through the online and form submission system. Any DES form, whether it's wetlands, shoreland, air resources, for those of you who might use various aspects of New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, anything you want to access, again, will be available through your account page if you've created it. Now that I've done that, you'll notice that I have a home tab, a finder tab, a history tab, and a help tab. From the history tab, this is what I mentioned earlier, when I click on history, and I'm not sure why it's, there we go. Every form that I, through this particular entry, have created will show here with a status. It's a draft, it's a draft, it's submitted. You'll notice that none of these say they are locked. You will have the ability to edit submissions and forms until such time as the Department of Environmental receives the fee. Environmental Services, I should say, receives the fee. When the Department of Environmental Services re receives the fee that's associated with an application, it will lock this because now it's in our processing timeframes and the clock is, is on us here at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. This right here is your profile. You can go in and edit it. I'm going to go back again to the homepage. As we mentioned earlier, if I come over to Form Finder and I type in Doc, again, this is within our draft for the purposes of this presentation. On June 15th, through the main system, you'll find an option for the non-title Doc Instructions Registration Form. That's the form you want to use. This will bring you to a landing page. That landing page will tell you what this form is for and how it's used. And I won't go through everything here this evening because much of it we've already touched on in our intro. But it will give you the rule package. We will have a new, there's a new chapter to the wetlands rules. We no longer stop at 900. It's ENVWT 1000. The purpose for this process, what it's used for, live links to the statute and the rules, processing time details, a brief outline of the process, the term and renewal process, and again, down to the bottom, this is not transferable. If, if a property is sold, the new owner will have to register the, the number to their name. So if a property is sold, the registration becomes invalid, but the new property owner will be able to go in through this process with the old registration number, complete a new registration, which will then grant that registration number to that new property owner. So this will also be used for that transfer. It will not be a separate form. So you'll notice again at the bottom, there are two options. If you don't want to use the online process, you can download the mail-in form. Most people, I think, are going to want to use the online process. And one of the reasons for this is the way this online process is set up, you'll notice that it's almost impossible to accidentally leave something out. So we're going to begin the form entry. The moment you begin the form entry and you've, you've clicked that button and entered this screen, if I were to go into history at this time, it will have this file with the unique registration submission number, which is listed right here, the date that I started it, the time that I started it. So at any time, I can save the progress, even at this point, come back to it later, and finish it later. So since we haven't done anything, we won't save progress yet. We'll just keep moving through. This first page is just notifying folks. And if you're using this form, it means we're going to conduct 
all of our communications with the registrant through their email electronically and through this website. So it's very important that your email addresses are correct. Once something is entered in here, if there is a mistake made and it's processed with the mistake embedded, it's not picked up in any of the reviews by either the owner or by DES, we can't go back and change addresses. Addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, you need to be very diligent to make sure that they're entered correctly. So again, this is an acknowledgement that by the way, if you wanna use this, it's all going to be electronic. If you don't want your communications to be electronic, now's the time to exit out of this and go back and get that, that paper form. There are two options for advancing. I can come over here to purpose or I can come down below next section purpose. It is something you have to click on, simply scrolling down won't move you. So the second section, you'll notice that the first section has been completed. There's nothing left outstanding, it's blue. Sections I haven't been to, gray. So the purpose again is for the repair of legally existing permanent, not, permanent structures and non-tidal waters, registering them so they're exempted from the wetlands permitting process. This form is being submitted either for registering something that hasn't been registered in the past or registering a structure that has been registered in the past, which is now being transferred to new owners. Hey, Darlene. Yes, ma'am. We currently have a question from Jamie Irving. He's got his hand raised. Do you want to take that? Go for it. What's Jamie's question? All right, I'm going to unmute him. Go ahead, Jamie. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, just, darling, sorry to interrupt, but I'm going back to the, um, if you enter your email incorrectly the first time, you can't go back and fix it. So if the email was entered incorrectly, is there some sort of redundancy that they could communicate through this portal? Or is that just like, so what, what your, So Mr. Irving, your profile, you will not need, as an, as an agent submitting this on behalf of an owner, your profile will have your email embedded in it. And your email is used in order for you to verify and activate your profile. So your email shouldn't be an issue. It will be entering in the owner's email. And okay. that doesn't get locked until you've submitted it to DES and DES has confirmed that we've received a voucher or a check for the fee. Okay. And then it will be locked. At that point, you can't go in and fix it but there are a number of places in here where it goes back and says please double check this and make sure it's correct so sure. throughout this process it's not like it's not that you can't go back while you're in this process of filling it out and double check it and fix it and again you'll be able to send it to the homeowner and let them or the structure owner and let the structure owner verify that it's correct and fix it if it's not yeah so there's a little redundancy for agents oh, yeah. On, acting on behalf of owners, but owners themselves, I guess, if they screw it up, I guess it's kind of on them. Mm, yes. <laughs> and it means that you'll get the copy um, as long as their profile is correct. Yep. And your profile is correct, and you're both listed as having access to manage the file. You should both receive notices when the notice of acceptance or rejection or receipt is sent out by the department. Is that correct, Maria? As long as their profile is correct and they're a user on a file, they will get that notice? Yeah, they can always go back and look at um, look at the history on top, and then they'll be able to see whatever document we have issued them. So, so if you have an account and you have access to registration, either as the agent or the owner, then you will be able to go back to your history and look back at what has been accepted or rejected. Thanks. So moving forward. So this next screen again is the purpose, it says what this is used for. There is nothing here. This is an informational screen to make sure people understand that they're in the right spot. So once that's been read, moving on to the next structure section, which is docking structure location. Now you'll notice now that we're getting into the, this is the information exchange part of things and data entry part of things. You'll notice that some of these fields have a red asterisk. Some of these fields do not. Everything with a red asterisk is required. 
you will not be able to submit the form to DES if a field that is marked with a red asterisk has not been completed. So coming through filling out municipality, let's say the stocking facility is in Alton. As soon as I enter it, AL, it starts to give me suggestions that will fit it's for data consistency reasons. So let's say we have a structure in Alton. Let's say our tax map is tax map two. If the town lists your tax map as O2, please just list the two. Don't pad it with zeros. This is just a data consistency, just for tracking purposes. Um, if it's 20, obviously it's 20, but if you have pre-padded uh, pre zeros, leave the zeros out. Block is optional. If there is a block, it would be best if you do put it in, rather than putting block under, um, rather than trying to put both block and lot under lot number. If there is a block, go ahead and enter it. If there is a lot number, go ahead and enter that. You have to. Um, if I don't, let's say I leave that as a blank, and I go on to the next section, you'll notice that docking structures location information tab stays red. This is what we mean by there are many sections in here and many redundancies to make sure that people understand it's not quite complete yet. These are the things that will help you from being rejected and these are advantages that are not available to you if you're filling out the paper copy. So under docking structures location, we're gonna put the lot number in. So we'll just put down and say it's lot number one. This next tab is optional, but since we're hoping to create a user interface that allows people to search for registered structures through a map interface, so something that resembles our wetlands planning permit planning tool or Google Earth, so that you can go in and look at a map such as this, find the property in question, click on that property, and what you will see is the registered plan for that property. That is our intent. That is a phase two effort um, to make that our, our user information distribution portal. By filling this out now though, what you'll be doing is facilitating our ability to geolocate these docs and make certain that they're in the right spot. So taking the map and going out towards the town of Alton and Alton Bay. Let's say that I decide, I go and I find my docking structure. Oh, there's my docking structure. I want to register right here. And yes, you can register large complex docking structures. You'll notice it's a, it stays as a hand feature. By double clicking on that, that point right there, it automatically sets a pin. And when it sets a pin, it automatically fills in the latitude and longitude down here. Now, if I realize after I've done this, oh, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't my dock. This was my dock. I can simply come over here and click on it and it should update. You do need to enter, again, this mapping is optional, but it would very much facilitate our ability to make sure that we've put the dock in the right place in the system. You do need to enter the water body name. And again, as soon as you start entering in the name, it pulls up, it starts to shrink the list of possibilities. In this case, we're on Lake Winnipesaukee. Now that we have that section completed, we move to the next one. It verifies, it shows blue, docking structures, location, all information is complete. And now we're moving on to the property owner. If the property owner is a trust or a company or an LLC, and you click yes, you'll notice that all you have space for here is the name of the trust, the company, or the association as soon as you click yes and their mailing address. If you click no because it's an individual that owns this structure, then it will pop up a first name that's required. So I'm naming this after a pet because that way I don't have to worry about offending anyone or accidentally implicating anyone. So let's just say that the owner of this docking facility 
has actually has this last name. Filled in both fields, they go to blue. By the way, on each of these fields, if you hover in the upper left, it appears very faint on my screen. I'm not sure if it appears better for anyone else. There's a little information tab that you can hover over that will tell you more about what information you should put in any one of these required fields. So if you have any thoughts, if you, if you have questions, please, by all means, when you're in here, hover over those tabs. Hopefully there'll be enough information in those tabs to, to help you navigate if you're not sure what to put in. What's the mailing address? Oh, let's see. I typed in a town, want to verify that town's actually in New Hampshire. I typed in Concord, it said New Hampshire. Make sure it really is New Hampshire and they don't live in Concord, Mass. If, they, if you need to fix that, fix that. In this case, I don't. But always verify you have the right state. Like there are too many Springfields. Enter in your zip code. You can validate the address. In this case, I made the address up. It's going to tell me, we have no idea where that is. If you've entered in a correct address, they should bring you to where it is. They should verify it. Yeah, we can find that. Again, for the purposes of this exercise, I know I made it up. Phone number is optional. Now, again, you should put the phone number for the property owner here because the property owner is going to be submitting this in their name. Email. This needs to be, if you hover over this, it has to be a valid email. It also needs to be the email for the person who's going to own the facility, the person who owns the facility, the person who's responsible for it long term. So, uh, let's see. Having finished everything in that section, if before, I go to the next section. Yes, before we move over, Darlene, we have a question from Cindy Volts. Cindy, I'm going to unmute you. you Ms. Are... Volts, you need to unmute yourself as well. You're going to, need to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the properties around the Lakes region have two docks on the property. Are they going to have to register each dock separately and will they have to pay $200, the $200 fee for each dock? They do not have to register their docks separately. Um, we consider docking structures to be the sum total of the structures on the frontage. So if they do one plan for the frontage and register that plan for the frontage, it's, it's just going to be that one registration that will cover everything. Uh, so I was thinking of when you clicked on the docking structure on the map. Um, you wouldn't have to click on both docking stru structures then. No, you might want to pick a mid uh, a midpoint between the two, or oh, okay. just in the property itself. The key is to get that point into the center of those docking facilities, so that we know as we are putting out a geospatially located user interface to distribute information in the future, we have a good centralized location for individuals to use. Uh, we want it to be property-based and site-based. So, and again, what they'll see is if they click on that point, it will pop up the registered plan, which would show all of the structures on that frontage, which should help clarify for them. Uh, we're finding people do much better with pictures and maps sometimes than uh, long permit descriptions if you're familiar with the normal way that we have been doing permitting in the past. Okay, thank you. No problem. Maria, is there anything else at this time? 
No, that was our only question at this moment. Okay, excellent. So this is a point right here, required certifications, where things will diverge, whether you are acting as an agent for a landowner or you are the landowner yourself. If you are the landowner, you absolutely should complete these required certifications. If you are not the landowner, but the agent for the landowner, then you should leave these blank and simply move on to the attachment section, which is next. I'm going to fill this out as if I am the owner. So all you need to do is enter in initials, um you could if you wanted to type out your name but you're entering something an acknowledgement entry into each one of these fields stating that you've read them and you agree to them so that these are things that are the qualifying criteria that are listed in the law for the use of this particular process the first is that you're not part of a compliance or civil action uh, the section is, to the best of your knowledge, everything you've done is complete and true. Um, again, complete and true. And you understand that if it's not complete and true and you know it's not complete and true, you probably should go fix it or there could be some ramifications in the future. Having initialed all of these statements, proceed to the next section. Again, if you're the agent, leave it blank the owner can take care of this part when they submit it the next thing you want to have is the attachments so there are various things that are required as part of this process to show that you do in fact qualify and to maintain the registration the first one of these is evidence that you in fact meet the qualifying criteria now that evidence as we discussed in the intro could be photos or a plan showing that it pre-exists the January 1st, 2000 date, and it's still in the same size, location, and configuration it was on those plans or photos that were taken before the January 1st, 2000 um, date that's set, that you're not part of a residential structure, that it's those structures don't have any residential use. Uh, it's not filled for the purpose of making land. If it's a filled peninsula, you can't do that for this process. That's language included in the law. Um, and finally, that you know maybe it has a permit. So how do you submit that evidence to come in with this? The way that you do that are through these fields here. Now, unfortunately, there's a little bug in the software that eventually we're gonna be able to turn off, but right now you'll notice that there's a confidential box. As soon as I enter something into this field and upload a file, it's going to ask me if I want to keep it confidential. It can't be kept confidential. So there's a note here that when you attach evidence, if you check the confidential box, that that's not, that's not this is actually the public information that the registry is based on. It's not intended to be uh, confidential. We will be fixing that, that box at some point in the future. So, we need some kind of evidence that the structure is legally existing. So we need to choose a file. It will ask where I wanna go. And you can, from here, go into wherever, whatever kind of file you want to upload. You can upload a PDF, you can upload a JPEG, you can upload um, a Word document. I really wouldn't recommend that. Um, what we do need you to do is whatever document you do upload, please make certain that the document that you upload is less than 10 megs in size. If it's more than 10 megs in size, this is going to create a problem. Use um, a compression program, whatever, save your files at a smaller size, even this file at 2.8 megs, this is a picture of a permit, probably bigger than it needs to be. So in this case, I have a picture of a permit that I can use to show that my permanent structure is legal. So I'm going to upload it. I'm gonna click highlight that one. I'm gonna open it. It tells me the file name here. And now all the red icons saying that I need to upload something are gone. 
when the homeowner wants to verify that, uh, yeah, that is what I want it to be, or anyone else wants to come back in, all you have to do is click on the file name. And the way my computer works, it will show up here in the upper part, open the file. Yep, that's what I loaded. So yep, I have the right document in there. This is that confidential button I mentioned. It, even if you click it, unfortunately, the last thing you want is your evidence to be confidential and your evidence won't be confidential because that's what's getting your permit, uh, your registration accepted. The next item you wanna have is your plan. Now it's important to note that the plans are going to be the primary document of record that we're sharing with the public. The plan does need to have the tax map and lot number on it because again, we're tying things to site. It does not need to have the owner's name on it. You can use the same plan for the re initial registration and for each subsequent renewal, so long as that plan is the plan of record for the site. And on renewals, it's likely you will not be required to upload a new plan so long as things are the same as they were previously. You will only need to upload a new plan of renewals if in fact something on the site has changed through a permitted action. So again, coming through here, plans. I need to enter one. This is the plan of record. It does need to be accurate. It does need to show the full frontage. It does need to show the structures at a scale, at some multiple of 10 scales. So one is 10, one is 20, one is 30. If you would add dimensions, that would be preferred. Do you absolutely have to? No. I can tell you that uh, you should add a scale bar. We will be requiring that a scale bar is added when we go through formal rulemaking because it's the scale bar that allows us to verify that the scale is correct. If you print a, a plan off and the printer that you have doesn't automatically uh, size the document perfectly as it should be. So scale bars, please, if you're an agent, put those on there. Start getting that habit now. You need to show all of the structures. You need to show the structural support. Now, if you're a seasonal dock, that doesn't mean you need to show the pipes or you need to show the floats. It means if you're a permanent dock, you do need to show the pilings, the piling locations, the cribs, and the crib dimensions. You should also show anchor pads for seasonal docks if you're choosing to register a seasonal dock. Identify the property lines. Uh, you should identify the 20 foot setbacks, but understand this, the 20 foot setbacks, if a dock is legally existing, they're not applied retroactively. So you're showing them for reference, but they're not gonna have ramifications. Once you have a plan that meets these requirements, and again, if you're an agent, remember this is what, if you're putting this out here, you don't have to put your name on it. Uh, you should put the drawing date on it. That's always a good plan. But if you put your name on it, it's, uh, it, it is uh, a reflection of your ability to, to get this done and to do it well. So here's your plan submittal. Again, you can do an image or a PDF, please. You can submit a multi-page PDF here. So if you do a plan and a profile because the structure has a canopy or is a boathouse, you can do that as a two-page PDF by all means and load just one file but at least one file is required. So I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna pick something that kind of looks like a plan. This is technically actually a map, but I'm gonna load it. As soon as it's in, I have a file name and it no longer shows as read. Again, can't be confidential. Dated photographs, you do need to take photographs showing the structures to verify, we use those photographs to verify that yes, it looks like what's shown on the plans that are going to be the registered plans of records. So go in, choose a file that shows uh, the photos of the structure. See if I have something here that's actually photographs of a dock. We'll pick this one. Automatically uploads it. Please, again, don't be confidential. Now we get to our first, we've, those are actually the only things that are required as part of this process. Plans, photo, and evidence that you qualify. Once we receive it, when we're reviewing it, what we will be reviewing is that your plans have all of the details required. 
that your plans match the evidence submitted for the structure, whether it was based on date of construction or a previously issued permit or some other document, such as maybe there was a, a plan, an old survey or something that you have access to. Whatever combination you have to show it was a pre-existing structure, we'll check the plans, make sure they match the historic information. We'll check the photos, make sure the photos show the structures that are on the current plans. And as long as you have those things there and you've completed all the fields, which you have to do because you can't submit it unless you have, you should be accepted. And again, that acceptance will take place within 10 days and will assign you your registration number. So this is the first place where you go back and do a review. So the review section. Um, Darlene, yes. just, just a point I want to make about the attachment. You could upload multiple attachments under the same heading. So you could do one picture at a time and just upload another picture and then you can so you could have multiple pictures, for example, under the photographs. Yes. Um, just one, one point to make. Also want to let you know it's 7.54. Okay. Um, so we are running out of time, but we do have one question from Paul Goodwin. So I'm going to unmute him. And Mr. Goodwin, you're going to need to... Perfect, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hey, Darlene, I don't believe it's said on that list of items you have to include that a cross-section is required. I would go back and look at the rule package. If it's in the rule package and not on that page, we will update that page. And if it's not in the rule package, then don't submit a cross section. Okay. We may add it in the future, but if it's not there now, then it's not required. Okay, seems pretty trust, loose. Seems pretty yeah. loose, you don't need one. Yeah. If, um, if it's if it's not if it's in the rules, I trust Maria would have put it into this this. So we'll need to check in the formal rulemaking to see if that's something that we need to add or not. But we have kept this. This thing is very faithful. Does not roam from the rule and statutory requirements. Okay. And the second part of the same question is you don't have to you don't have to use turbidity or erosion controls or anything like that, or show it. I guess. Uh, you don't have to show that on your plans. We are looking for plans of structures. You should note that in the rules, it does say that when you're, this is to register your structure. When you're conducting your repairs, um, you do still have to maintain, and this will come out in your registration document that please note, you cannot do work that results in a water quality violation when you're conducting your repairs. So there's getting things into the registry, but once they're in the registry, it's understood that you'll be able to repair those structures at any time while their registration is valid. And very simply, you'll need to maintain turbidity controls as needed to avoid water quality violations. Okay. And that will come on the document that's mailed out to folks. Thanks. So, Moving through, um, again, there's a review. You'll start to go through, this is your first chance to proofread. You've got the, you're doing this electronically. Docking structures location, you can verify your municipality, your tax map, block number, that all of these things are correct. And now at this time, if you want to, you could go back into them by saying, oh, I was wrong, my tax map. Is actually lot 11. So if I simply go back to docking structures location, I can go in here to lot number and say, oh, that should be an 11. Then I can go back to review. My lot number is 11. So this is your chance to go back and proofread and fix things like your email. No phone, there's the email. Oh, look, my email address is incorrect if I need to. I can go into property owner information and fix it. The certifications have been checked off. If they hadn't been, required certifications would be read. Now you're at the point of certify and submit. Next section. So if I click certify and submit, if I'm the owner, I can submit this at this time. If I'm not the owner and I'm the agent, then there's something that I need to do right here. I need to make certain that my client has created a profile and I need to know what email address they used to complete that profile. 
once I know the email address they use to complete their login to end forms, I can go up here to this little gear settings icon and it allows me to manage shared access. When I open that, I can enter my client's email. Click, you have to click, can manage access to the submission. It's very important that you click this because this is what's going to give them the ability to receive the documents through the system. So highlight that, click add. Yep, I'm going to get an email. As soon as I hit confirm, the system is going to email my that email address that you just sent with a notification that there is a file for me to review in the system so that the owner of the structures can go in, access this, and complete it by clicking off the certifications and the submit button. Once that's done, let's see. You'll notice right here also, there are two users associated with access to this. So I'm done with that part of it. It brings me back to the certify and submit page. Let's say I am the owner and I do want to certify. I've, I've already done that and I want to submit it now. I click the submit form. It will tell me again, here's my submission number that's specific to this, this registration. It lets me know that the department is awaiting payment. The department will not be able to accept electronic payments through the system until December. So in the interim, we will, through the system, it will generate a voucher letting you know that the fee for this is $200 and you will pay by mail. So you click pay by mail. It will again, list it as a waiting and it will allow you to print and download a payment voucher. This voucher, right here for end forms has the address that you want to mail it to here at the department. And it has your unique submission number so that when we receive the check, we know exactly what registration in the system it gets applied to. The moment we receive that check and enter it into the system, your status on that will update from payment due to submitted, at which point the submission becomes locked and you can no longer go in and edit it. It's now on the 10 day response time for the department. So I want to go back to here. Actually, I want to get out of, sorry, this is the one thing that I haven't had to get out of is this form. So that brings me back to here. So again, I've printed that off. I can now mail it in. If you don't want to print it off, you can bring it later. Once you've printed it, if you want to return to home, you can come to this field. I want to see what the status of the registration I just submitted was. I will go to history. When the history tab opens, you'll notice that there is a submitted application with a fee that is due that was generated at eight o'clock on the evening of June 8th. That's this project. This is the summary button. If I open this, by opening this tab, I can see the status of this. You'll notice it says the balance is still listed as due. As soon as we receive it, that will change and this will become submitted and under review. You can still we see what the attachments are. So long as this is listed as orange and due, you can come in and revise the submission. By clicking this, it will, it will send you back into the form and you can go in and fix any part of the form that needs to be fixed. So again, once we've received the fee and this changes, we have 10 days, we will generate a letter 
stating that it has been accepted and includes your registration number to post on the end of the dock. Uh, that can be painted on by hand or if you want to use numbers similar to the numbers one would purchase to put a bow number on a boat, that's another good idea for how to list your registration number and post it on the end of the dock. It needs to be, it needs to be kept on the liquid end of the dock. Um, again, when we get into permanent rulemaking in the future, the formal rulemaking process, we may see some updates to the posting requirements and everyone will be kept aware of those. But for the time being, it is something that you can add to the dock on your own. But that's it. That is the entire completion of the registration process through the online system. You'll get a response emailed to you through this system and through the email addresses that were submitted to us through the system, automatically generated the moment we um, finalize the accept, the accept letter or the reject letter, which as you can see, since it pretty much makes sure that you have everything. Shouldn't be many reject letters. I expect it's going to be a vast, vast majority of acceptance. So I guess we're in the question section. Yes, we currently do not have any raised hands. Um, if, if somebody has a question, please raise your hand. And just one thing I want to point out, um, when we're saying 10 days to review the submission, it is 10 business days, not oh, calendar you. days. Thank you. Still no questions. I once had a professor tell me that when there are no questions, that either did, means you did an amazing job or you did so badly that no one has any idea what you've just said. Somebody please ask a question. Uh, we currently have a question from Rosemary. Gonna unmute you. You are unmuted. You're gonna need to go Ooh. ahead. Thank you. Um, this is uh, to uh, follow up that one question about if there's multiple docks on a property. Do you put the same number on the multiple endpoints or just on one of them? Uh, you would put the same, all those docks in the facility will have one number. So you would be best served to prevent people from getting confused and asking questions if anybody is looking for a number, like say Marine Patrol or a Conservation Commission, to put that same number at the end of each dock that's registered. We have a question from Janice Farley. I see you just lowered your hand, so I'm not sure if you want to speak or not. Yes, I do have a question. If you have a doc that has no uh, permit that you can find, but you have a Google Earth dated photo prior to uh, 2000, is that evidence that it qualifies? It could be. It would be nice if you had, the nice thing, if you have a 2000 file using the history feature of Google Earth, you might be able to find a 2000, a 2008, a 2009, and take a series of screenshots. And then uh, the plans and the um, ground level photos for the current conditions. And yes, that is the kind of evidence that we are willing to accept. Great, thank you. We do not have any other questions, so. I, I, oh, I, sorry, I'm supposed to raise my hand. Um, I have one more question. Sorry, I think yeah, I missed so, do you mind identifying yourself? Oh, sorry, it's Jamie Irving. Thank you. Um, I think I missed this, I had to step away for a minute, but um, all the, this is kind of a dumb question, but all this is public information for the doc registration. I assume the, the owner's email is not part of that public information, correct? No, that's not going. The only thing that we want to make available on a public interface is the registered plan that goes with a specific property. That's the only thing that is relevant, what is legally existing on the frontage. Okay. I, I figured as much, but I, I missed that. I just wanted to confirm that was the case. Yes, and from the actual online form side of things, just want to stress out that only the owner and the agent, the people that had been given permission um, to view the submission can view those. So yeah. if, if, you, if you're if you an agent, you cannot go ahead and un unless an owner gave you 
permission to see another submission that they have, you won't be able to look at that. Uh, the online mapper, we're probably just going to give out information, uh, the, the actual, like, like Darlene said, the mapping, um, the map associated with it, the plans, yep. sorry. Yeah, so we, we have a number of the clients that, you know, kind of prefer a bit of discretion. So as long as, you know, the, the public information is minimal. We actually feel that this will provide somewhat improved discretion because again you have a property identified by a town tax map and lot number and you have a, a plan there's a reason that we didn't require that you put the owner's name on the plan so compared to the current permitting which has a name address an address and other information we want this is the registered plan and it goes with this lot that's great awesome thank you folks You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Bailey, you had your hand up and down, and I don't know if it was by accident, so I'm going to unmute you and please let us know if you have a question. We are not hearing you, so I'm going to assume you do not. You raise your hand again and you self-muted yourself. So you're going to have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. loud and clear. OK, great. Uh, what size sheets do you want for the plans? Um, and and what, at what level of precision do you need these plans at? Are, 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 and also, do you need these to be tied to the boundary at all? It does say that you have to have the property lines on the plans. Um, your plans are going to be coming in electronically. So a plan file that's less than 10 megs in size. So if you wish to uh, do them as 11 by 17, eight and a half or 11, eight and a half by 11, or was it uh, 36 by 24, 34 by 22, whatever the architectural plan size is, uh, we can electronically accept any of them. Just keep the file size, the resolution down so that they're less than 10 megs. Um, level of accuracy, again, one is 10 scale, one is 20 scale, one is 30 scale. Please go in factors of 10, not five 30 seconds scale. Um, uh, we do expect that, you know, if it's six foot six inches, it's six foot six inches on the plans. So they should be ac as accurate as you would normally submit. Okay, so, but, we, we don't, you don't need closed plans of one in 10,000 precision. And the next thing is, if you need the property boundaries, then these all need to be stamped by a land surveyor stamp, correct? Okay, so this is, again, it's the same as the wetlands rules are now. We are not seeking the actual angle means full distance. We're looking at the frontage. Um, and those are the, the what is most important to us. So we are not looking for a survey plat. Uh, it is the same level of accuracy and the same requirement as any other wetland plan. Uh, it is not going to be used for determining property boundaries, but it is to give us the relative accuracy of how far do we expect to find the dock from the property line. We will not, not be requiring that people get surveys, but we're happy to accept plans from surveyors if they choose to. And that is all the question we've had. Okay, so moving through, again, this whole thing is gonna become available and we're fully online and functional on June 15th. Uh, you'll be able to find, even now on the website, you can find a link to the interim rules. For formal rulemaking uh, for the long-term official rules will begin in the next, probably end of July and August. That gives us a time to identify where the bugs are that we need to work out. Uh, so that we can address those through the formal rulemaking. There are fact sheets available on this voluntary process, um, as well as an updated version of the old DOC permitting uh, fact sheet. Those are available on the website. And this recording of this uh, particular webinar will also be made available on June 15th, so that if anybody wants to go in and watch it so that they can see how this is, is filled out, um to go back and refresh their memory or if 
you know, just to advise if you want to tell clients here, you can go in. Um, I don't have to explain it. You can actually go in and watch it. Uh, the link will be available so they can do just that. You will also find it on the website under uh, wetland news at the des.nh.gov website. So at this time, I'd like to thank you for attending. I guess, Maria, if you want to do one last question sweep. Um, if you have additional questions in the future, you're welcome to email myself. Uh, if you have any problems registering, please contact the Business One Stop uh, email that's shown here. Last question. We have one by Janice Farley. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. One last question. So once your doc is registered, um, do you need to advise that you're making repairs or you just can make ongoing repairs whenever you feel like it? I do not believe there is any requirement in the rules right now that you advise us that you are making repairs. You might want to let local code or anyone know, but the idea is that people can go on, will be able to go online and look if you're doing work and say, yes, that's a registered docking facility. And they're allowed to make repairs at any time. It's, we're accepting that you're registered, that you'll maintain compliance. As was asked earlier, um, you need to be certain you're not uh, causing a water quality violation. So if it's a very simple repair that is not going to kick up sediment, you might not need turbidity. If you're replacing a crib or bringing a barge in that might create some turbidity with the rise and fall of waves, as a, as a professional, uh, you probably know what your equipment will generate. You need to have your curtains in if you're putting out uh, turbidity from the site when you're doing the work uh small repairs maybe not so just good business practices at that point okay thank you and we have no other questions seeing we have no other questions i'd like to thank everyone for um for attending the session this evening by all means if you have any questions or critiques please send me an email or you can send an email. I don't think, Maria, I don't think we gave them your email, so you're off the hook. Any criticism or uh, constructive comments, please, by all means, email me, let me know. Uh, anything you might want to see in the formal rulemaking process on the flip side of this when we get it started, please let me know. I'd like to thank you all for attending again and uh, look forward to testing out this new process with you on, on June 15th. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening. We'll stop recording. Thank uh you. -huh.